half break all the time uh, because I wasn't used to driving in um, city traffic. Your heart was in your mouth much of the time. So once you get onto the country roads, it's not too bad. There's an occasional truck that you beep at from miles behind and get there. Anyway, it's got quite pleasant in the countryside in, in Gujarat. And it uh, got eventually uh, to this reserve. Unfortunately, it was closed because the monsoon hadn't been too good that year. And this means that uh, there wasn't uh, much bird life around. There was a place further on where there was a lake and an artificial wetland, and uh, we were advised to go there. Wasn't expecting very much, but was lucky. And there were a lot of water birds there. And the first thing which you may have seen very briefly up on here was a flamingo. Oh, wonderful. Uh, there were flamingos that were taking off in fresh water. You can see the reefs behind. Normally associated with um, uh, salt water, but they're very beautiful. They're the greater flamingo, and they're on uh, the, this artificial lake, among other reserves. Nobody disturbed them. Many Indians have a very, very compatible attitude towards wildlife, and um, it can often thrive alongside people, even in quite densely populated villages, which was pleasing. They are spoonbills, not the ones that you get here, but the same as the ones you get in Europe. And they're called your Asian spoonbills these days. Uh, so they are the spoonbills. As you can see, they're starting to build crests on them. Some have got crests, and others haven't. Nearby, near a fishing village, were uh, some drongos, and I managed to get a shot of uh, a pair of them there, as you can see. This was my uh, uh, boatman who uh, took me out there and uh, they uh, wait for tourists and uh, they seem to uh, be part of the economy of the villages there and they could certainly do it to supplement their income. Beyond that, we went on to a place called the Ram of Kutch and uh, I'd heard of it um, as a child uh, when I was a young guy out here too. It was a big thing in 1965 because the Pakistanis had invaded India through the Ran of Kutch. The first thing that comes to my mind is I wonder if they machine gunned all those wild asses there. And sure enough, they didn't get them all because they're too cunning. They run up, but they did. For target practice, they shot at the wild asses. Anyway, there I am with my driver on the middle of this salt plain, which really is old sea. You can't farm it because it's all salt. But thank God for that, because surprisingly, we've got some slightly higher sandy areas with acacia scrub on them called becks. And that's where you get wild animals. They shelter there or build dens in there, nest in there, depending on what they are. So I spent a lot of time uh, driving over the uh, endless miles and miles of uh, these becks and the salt plains in the Iran of Kutch. That is a spotted eagle, a greater spotted eagle. On a, on a mound and uh, was just uh, sitting there looking for prey. Um, I know that's more flamingos, but I thought it was a beautiful shot. <laughs> uh, taking the right light, I thought it brings a white out in them as well as a pink, and you can see the acacia bushes behind. Uh, he didn't say very much this driver I was with. We drove at a high speed. He was on the phone to someone and we pulled up at a big stupa, which was God knows what it was doing there. It might be part of an old ruin in the middle of the uh, step. And he just pointed to it and said, Peregrine Falcon. And sure enough, that's what it was, a, a wintering Peregrine Falcon. And um, I thought I was lucky to see that. I thought it was great to see a Peregrine in India. Didn't do much, just sat there. I was very pleased to see these birds too. They're like the Brolga, they're the Eurasian crane. And all the way from Britain again now, they're back in Britain, across to eastern Siberia and China. What a vast range they occupy. Migrate south to northern Africa and south to India. And uh, there were hundreds of them there. The villagers didn't disturb them or anything. And woe betide you if you had uh, disturbed them in any way, which I thought was a great attitude. They're, they're the Eurasian crane. Um, I couldn't resist showing you that shot because it had the right condition. It's one of the lakes which the monsoon could bring. If you get a heavy monsoon, they get 
extensive lakes and it's not so heavy they're smaller lakes but there's nearly all some rain there and some migratory birds that are there as well as some residents but it was a nice calm atmosphere after we looked at that i wonder what they were driving around this godforsaken salt pan for in a vehicle with the lights on what they're going to show me and we stopped and the, the, the little bird like a big moth flew ahead of us it did it again and for a third time i could get out of the car and photograph it it was named after a British Army officer interested in birds called Sykes. So it's called Sykes nightjar. It's one of many species of nightjar in Africa. I never thought I'd see any nightjars, so I was very appreciative of, of, of that. So we're going, I seem to be going from one wonderful thing to another. That is a step eagle. And I never knew how to tell the difference between a step eagle and any other eagle. <laughs> But when you get close up to it, you can see that the corners of its mouth go beyond the eyes, which is not usual. I don't know if you can see it well there, but I can see it from here. And um, I'll still share that one with you. They're found in Kazakhstan and, and Russia, and they migrate south for winter. In the no northwestern extremity of this area, just coming through into India, is a Middle Eastern bird called a hypercolis. This is the great. Hypercolis. I've never seen, never seen them in bird books before. And there it was. So I was privileged to see that. And they were there because there were some berries uh, on that tree. And that's what they were doing, feeding on the berries. I never thought I'd see that either. I've never seen one in my life. In England, I never saw one. You could get them there. I uh, wasn't allowed as a kid to go out onto Godforsaken salt marshes in the dawn and, and dusk in East Anglia. Or anyway, it's called the Shorty It Out. And um, there it was, I had no idea that they went that far across into Kazakhstan, Siberia, moved south in the winter. Last place on earth I expect to see a short-eared owl was in here. They're not short-eared at all, it's just they have little sticky-up feathers. Another one with sticky-up feathers, a much bigger bird, and it's a Eurasian eagle owl. And uh, I don't know if it looks all that big to you, but it certainly was a, a, a big bird. And in Germany, they can kill young roe deer and, and, and quite decent sized grouse and things like, like that. And uh, I love the German name for them, they're called Uhu. Is that one of them pig or what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this reminds me of a powerful owl that says Uhu all the time. Right, there's um, uh, a uh, jungle owlet and uh, it has got another name and I can't quite remember it now, but um, it was in a hollow in a, uh, a wooded reserve I went into it sort of quite by chance in the in the daytime. So I stood on the bonnet of the vehicle and photographed it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was only one species of bee to, uh, when I was there. There's quite a, a few in Asia, but this is the little green bee to, and it's the only one found in that part of India. But magnificent little bird. You can see them just be driving along the roads and might be on telegraph wires or zooming in front of you or over the fields, snatching insects and so on. Charming little creature. Uh, green, little green beard. This is fairly common in India. It's like a spurling plover is here, what they call the mask plover these days. And that's a red wattled plover. And it's a standard Indian lakeside bird, I suppose, in wet fields and things too. And their calls are just about known to everybody, same as um, uh, most people know the call of the mask plover, which you can just get outside the pub in the Memorial Reserve late at night. So that's the Indian equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um, one of the shrikes. I saw several shrikes there in the desert, and that's uh, the salt desert, I should say. And that's a uh, long-tailed shrike. And there are various other shrikes, and they take a bit of sorting out because I'm, I'm not used to them. <laughs> uh, in, in Britain, they only had one kind that became extinct. They think uh, uh, with the big insects dying off through agricultural spraying everywhere, but recently they've reappeared again, starting to breed at far lower numbers than when I was there. But India still has a lot of shrikes and uh, they're nice to see. Uh, that warden I was with, I remember saying to him in the deer forest where there are lions, the only place in Asia left where the lions have been slaughtered everywhere else, right through the Middle East and Greece and Iraq, Iran, 
But anyway, there's still some, thankfully, in India, and I thought it was a privilege to see them. I did do, I saw only lionesses, they're far more common than lions, but they're breeding well, and each lioness that I saw had two or three young. There's one. But the guy that I stood next to, I said to him, what's the poaching right, rate like now here? And he didn't say anything, he just went zero. And I'm so pleased about that because I remember when they were poached like crazy, they used to be killed and poisoned because they might attack buffalo and cattle, but there's plentiful deer and antelope, the wild boar there now, so they only rarely take any domestic stock. There's a female close to the vehicle scratching her claws. Uh, it's an Asiatic lion. To me, this is a marvelous animal that um, other people are indifferent to. It's a, it's a male black buck, and I was lucky to get that shot from my bedroom window, for God's sake, in a place called Velavada. Now, uh, Alan went there, Alan Fairley, and he told me about it, showed me pictures of it. I thought, my God, I'd love to go there. There were hundreds of these antelopes, which I had despair of as a kid because I knew they were being slaughtered, left, right, and center. There used to be thousands. And it was down to only a very low thousands, but they are, they're, they're completely protected throughout India now, and they're making a slow comeback. But of course, you've got limited habitat. That's the Valavadar National Park. There are hundreds of them there. And what a sight, they're marvelous to see a whole herd of them. I think I might have a picture of a herd. Not that they're cranes, they're cranes on the grasslands in that same reserve, European cranes of the Valavadar. Lucky to see that, I thought. Uh, I was told by the driver that near this area there are some dead trees, and if you're very lucky, you might see one of these. Do you know what they are? Yes, I said. It had caught a, a, a lark, and it was feeding on it. It's called a lagger falcon. And they're not migratory. Well, they are a bit, but not from <laughs> Russia right down to India. They're an Indian national, and well, also found in Pakistan, but they're a lot, not less, a lot less common than they used to be. Lagger falcon. I thought it was wonderful to be uh, where I could see them feeding on their prey, which I missed him catching it. But mm. very... Now, this is the largest antelope in India, it's the size of a cow. And thank God the Indians think it's a cow or treat it as one. That means it's sacrosanct, they can't touch it. You see them in fields, you see them wandering around everywhere. In neighboring countries, they don't have a Hindu belief, they've been killed off. So places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, I believe there are a few in Nepal, but that's about it. You don't get them in Sri Lanka. So they're very much an Indian thing. That's a female. She's got a drongo on her back and she's suckling a calf. And I thought I was damn lucky to get that shot. That was really lovely. That was where the black buck are. And there are a few black buck there on the plains. Well, that's self-explanatory. I couldn't <laughs> be a cultural moron and not go to India without seeing certain things. So I looked around a few temples, some of which were new, being built there, and I had to go here and sit where Diana uh, sat. So uh, I thought I'd throw that one in just for clothes on. Okay, there's a Taj Mahal. I was lucky enough to have a Muslim go and show around it, and he could explain about how it was based on how this earthly paradise of a mausoleum and the gardens around were based on the paradises described in the Quran, so I was very grateful for that, he uh, taught me a lot. That is very similar, or might even be the same species, as the data here. It's called uh, an Indian data, and there's one in Africa and one in America, and they keep going backwards and forwards. I think DNA studies might prove it, whether they're uh, closely, uh, whether the same species, or they're all different, but closely related, I don't know. Nice bird. Now, when I first saw men cycling and straining their little thin legs to pull a big fat couple of Europeans or Americans, they used to think that's a terrible thing. It goes back to colonial times. That's terrible. And when they were motorized, and I said to this guy, Isn't it wonderful that you've got motorized now? He says, No, it is not. I said, What do you mean it is not? And he said, I do not get the exercise. <laughs> and, and, you know, so they're starting to think like we do from this yoga lot that we just replaced. <laughs> He needed the exercise. I felt a lot better about it. <laughs> but I thought, well, fair enough, because I'm like that too. Now, that is a immature, a young Egyptian vulture. I know it's called Egyptian vulture, but you get them in southern Europe, you get them in East Africa, you get them in um, India as well. So it's not really a good name for it. But 
There it is, and uh, it was a lucky shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. must have so? gone. <laughs> I so? thought that was an owl in the tree. <laughs> no, honestly, I don't know why we put it. It's gone since we set it. Up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that chipmunk looking thing is a, uh, a, a palm squirrel. And they're very common even in the towns and villages in India. Cute little thing. And I uh, photographed that one in a bird sanctuary um, uh, on, on the side because it was just begging to be photographed and very tame, cheeky. That's called a Brahmi starling, a bit like an Indian miner in the same family. Uh, and uh, that was close and confiding to, so I took the opportunity to fill the frame. Um, that is a purple heron, which we also get in Europe, fairly common in much of Africa and India as well. Uh, a nice uh, bird, not quite as large as the European grey heron, but uh, decent size, all the same, and it was nice to see it so confiding and close in the sanctuary. These are called ruddy shell ducks in uh, English, which sounds like you're swearing at them, but it's probably better the Indian English name, which is Brahmani duck, which is much more illustrious than saying ruddy shell duck. But still, take your pick, that's what they are, and they are revered in India, uh, Brahmani ducks. How could you kill a thing called a Brahmani duck if you were a uh, Hindu? That was the only snake I saw uh, but they were around, even though it was cold and, and everything, because they had serpent eagles dropping down to catch them. What smaller than that? Though. That's an Indian python, and it was very sluggish because it was cool. And I happened to see that by chance, it's fortunate. Uh, it's a, a young squaco heron, one of the many herons you get around in wetlands in protected places. And um, that's a congregation of different things, different kinds of stalks, mainly painted stalks, which are uh, great big bird, but fairly common there because they're not persecuted. Uh, I like those birds, we've got them here too. We've got them in Africa and Europe, they're called glossy ibis. How well they're looking up. In other words, they're like a, dip, uh, a dark uh, bin chicken. The Indian bin chicken. Yeah, Indian bin chicken, except we don't pick it. I was very proud of that, uh, that shot. It was a quiet evening. There's this me and one other guy around with a great big lens, a local guy, an Indian guy. We sat there peaceably and quietly together in the sunset. And late afternoon, at least, two Saras cranes, which we've got here in northern Australia, and a young one. And uh, I thought that was wonderful mm -hmm. that they, they bred there. Mm -hmm. Saras crane. Look at that, yeah. male, female, and young. Yeah. Well, that's pretty close to the bin chicken. It's uh, used to be classified as the same thing as ours, and the one in Africa. So we used to talk about sacred ibis. Now it's sacred ibis in Africa only, black necked ibis in India, and white ibis here in Australia. We used to make the one in minds up <laughs> because it's one of those things that keeps changing with different facts. Every time someone does a PhD or, or is a well revered person and speaks about it, that's it. They accept it and then change it back again. A bit like a boomer cow, keep changing it back. That is a lovely bird. Uh, it's a hoo-hoo. You get them in Europe too, and uh, uh, you've got the same one as you have in Europe in, in India. A lovely bird. It uses its bill to probe into the ground and it puts its crest up. And it, when it flies, it's like a giant butterfly. Mm -hmm. They're not always conspicuous either. They can be not far from you in, in a field with a few tufts of grass, fly up into a wall somewhere where they have a very scruffy nest and feed their nestlings. But a uh, lovely bird, nice salmon pink color. Well, they're common enough. That's a, 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 a ring necked uh, parrot, and uh, they're common enough in India. There's various species of parrot in India. I've seen them walking up to the Edmonds of Greer or to Coles or something like that. That's a strange noise. What's that? If you're lucky and you see it, it's one of them. And uh, as in England, where there's a couple of thousand of them now in, in parts of London, we've got them more and more um, building up in numbers and 
I think eventually they'll breed in the wild and we'll have yet another feral species. I don't know, it's hard to say. But they're lovely where they belong. That's a female samba, sambo, which is uh, a large deer. And uh, there are plenty of those around. If they're protected, they and the beautiful spotted deer, to my mind, the most beautiful deer in the world is spotted deer. I'll show you a picture later. Um, they breed up in numbers and, and uh, with a bit of protection, they respond very well. They go to prey for tigers and lions and leopards and things too. Um, that's another shot of an owl. Uh, looks like there are two of them there. Tell you, I'm not quite sure what, what uh, that was or where I took it. Um, really but you can see what it is a rather sleepy hour caught in the daytime peacock of course a favorite bird in india and nobody kills them and that's some uh, a male of course the other is a, a peahen we've got a raucous voice you can always tell when they're around they become very tame when they're protected and for years they've been revered and taken to europe by kings and princes and so they become a very well-known bird way outside of their range. Spectacular. Right. So we have uh, fighting between two Sambo males, fairly young ones, but they're jockeying for position uh, on the edge of a lake. Now that's um, the best shot that I managed to get of the tiger. Waited half an hour for that. It got up and it had just you know, eaten. And in the late afternoon, it's just walking down towards uh, the water to drink. And we have to hurry up because we have to be out of the uh, park by a certain time, otherwise you get fined. So we sped, I'm afraid, and bumped uh, uh, over <laughs> little um, mounds in the road and everything to get back. But by God, it was worth it. It was worth the risk because uh, at long last, I saw a tiger. And, uh, that was the highlight of my trip because I went out three times to see it. After the third time, I had to fly out from Delhi. I, I had no chance. I'd catch the train to Delhi. Wow. Third time, I saw them twice. I was getting exasperated. I said to the driver, can't we go up to this hill? Because uh, I knew from experience in Africa and elsewhere that if you can get on a hillside, if you know things are around and you glass with your telescope or binoculars the hillside systematically, then there's a good chance you'll see what it was. And I saw a Sambo deer, it was a big male, a big buck, and it's going quack, quack. And I knew that was the alarm call. So I'm looking around, looking, and I saw something orange. And sure enough, there's a tiger uh, not far above it, but it got scared, got spooked, ran away. And that was a great experience for me to see a tiger on a hillside, I couldn't photograph it. And then on the way out, uh, see one very close to just, Aim, uh, ambling down to the river to drink. Well, that's uh, finished my trip, as I'm saying. After that, got on the train, went to Delhi and flew home. So well worthwhile. I wasn't disappointed. I saw a lot of things. I'd love to go to India again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So if you want to ask anything, you, you may do so. Monty, 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 and you have the Langor monkey, which is sacred to the god Hanan. So, you know, you, you, you can't be nasty to them. And I wasn't in any cities long enough to see any monkeys, but I saw them in the wild, the rhesus monkey once, and, but they're very common in some areas, but I saw plenty of gray langurs um, in the trees and on the ground. Uh, there must have seen dozens of them, I suppose. So they were the only ones. There are other monkeys in India. Al Fairley told me about a rare one he saw, showed me a slide of it called the Nilgiri Langur, and uh, they're few and far between, but I didn't see anything special like that, no. Birds, so agriculture, do they use a lot of sprays in that, like they do 
Well, this is a problem. We there aren't enough scientists and teams and volunteers on the ground in India to know entirely what the pressures are on them. And they've often suspected this might be the case because there's pollution of rivers and they do use insecticide, but some village communities can't afford it. You know, it's like in Eastern Europe, which long after Western Europe became sprayed left, right and center in Britain and France and places like that, not in Poland and Romania. They were too poor to, to have mass spraying everywhere. I suspect it's the same in India. There are a lot of communities where they uh, farm without insecticide. It's hard to say. We, we know locally in some areas it, it has an impact, but overall it's, it's difficult to determine. But I would be interested to know, yes, I appreciate your concern. Anyone else like to ask me anything? Okay. Most of your animals and birds in Gujarat, or how much was in Rajasthan? In Rajasthan, I, I only went there because I knew I had a 50 50 chance of seeing a tiger. But there are other things that I saw in Rajasthan too, like uh, bears, two soft bears I saw, various birds uh, and things. But most of what you see there was in Gujarat. And I only did uh, two, three days, I think, in Rajasthan altogether. So, yeah, the great bulk of where I was was in different parts of um, Israel. Too much desert in Rajasthan. Yes, there. well, there is, because it's a big state, though, and in the north, there's certainly desert there. It's very deserty. But where I was in the southeast corner near Uttar Pradesh and so on, it, it's. Um, less deserty. In fact, it has forests there. And where I was was a national park called where the tigers were, 50% chance of seeing them in the winter time, 90% chance in the summer because it's so stinking hot they come down into the riverbed to <laughs> lounge in the water there, but I didn't want to be there in summer. So I was lucky because it's 50-50. And um, the, it used to, Ranthambore used to be a preserve of a Maharaja. And there's old forts there that go back to before Queen Elizabeth I time, you know, and we're told they must have been impregnable or almost so from various invasions coming in. But where, where I was, it was certainly well forested in, in Rantambor, but much of the rest would have been cleared for farming, I suppose. But, but um, it was not desert. I didn't go to the Rajasthan there. I booked this. I went up to the local travel agent in St. George, it doesn't exist anymore. In fact, they're emptying it now. And saw the girl there, Belinda, and told her what I wanted to do. And she said, Oh, you should speak to my colleague. She's down on the south coast, and her name's Vivian Craig. And she uh, and her husband run specialized in, in running tours to India, Sri Lanka and Nepal. And she's interested in wildlife and she does wildlife tours. Here's her address, speak to her. So I did do, and she was telling me over the phone, I've never met her, but we got on quite well. So, oh, David, you love it there. And she's been about 20 odd times and she organized it all for me and rang me up now and again. Would you mind doing this? Or do you want to do that? You know, do you prefer this or that? And she'd organized an itinerary, sent it to me, revised it later. So it was all quite well planned. So I did it purely through an experienced travel agent who specializes and knows some of the guides, some of the drivers, and some of the people that check on you and ask if everything's all right in various places. They'll phone you up and check how you, if you're happy with everything and how you're doing and see if you're ill or anything like that. So it's pretty like a military organization. And, uh, I appreciated it because it was well over. Mm. So you have dinner, one driver all the time. Right? Had the same driver all the time, but when you got to a specific reserve, he, he couldn't speak English very well, you know. So you got to a specific reserve, you had a driver then of a Jeep and your guide. The guide spoke English well, driver couldn't speak any at all. Now, this I thought was a good system because you, you might think, how annoying. But in the Gear Forest, for instance, the locals support the national park and everything, and they employ, go out of their way to employ unemployed young men, only speak Gujarati, but they don't care because they just drive the vehicle and the guide takes, he doesn't have to say anything except, 
how are you or hello or something that's it and so it, it doesn't matter they uh, employ these people but it's very hard to get drivers a job like that which doesn't pay a great deal you know for people to speak excellent english you know and, and but you know you like to uh, adjust after a while you know i could have told what he said at first you know i'd say all this coming in he said oh come in yes and he said all in power so what well, says all in power yellow power oh yellow flower yeah so eventually i got sort of talk that way myself you know and say you want to see muslim sorry you want to see muslim and, he, and then you walk to this place as museum, Gujarat Museum. <laughs> but you get used to each other and uh, we got on quite well, but it was hard to carry on an in-depth conversation. You know? Yeah, all part of the, <laughs> all part of the experience. Yeah. Have a question? Well, that's a stretch of me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but how was your accommodation? Sorry? How was your accommodation? Fine. Um, the accommodation was uh, good, uh, but it varied from uh, place to place. Uh, sometimes I was in a big hotel with a lot of traffic noise outside, except in the early hours of the morning, overlooking the waterfront, a place called Jamnagar. I hated it, <laughs> but it was a fine hotel. Uh, but I much better liked it in some of these lodges in the countryside where you only heard animal and bird night noises at night. But um, no, they're all good because, you know, they, they, before COVID, they had quite uh, a big um, tourist industry, which they never had before. And um, I was quite impressed with things that were put on good quality accommodation for tourists, you know, both Indian and, and uh, overseas. Food. So there's no worries about that. You, you, you didn't have any sleazy accommodation or anything like that by any means. The Indian might have a seeing here all the time and giving chase the sea was a way sometimes in yes but the area where i was in gujarat the place is taken by other mines there's two kinds there's the bank miner and another kind of see sometimes they call that um starling that i showed you or a, a miner so you know if you count that as a miner as well that's it. There are, there are many other parts of India further in the centre, the northeast, swarming with Indian miners, the same as here. But there's several kinds of miners in India. There must be about nine or ten different kinds, you know, and they tend to inhabit and replace each other in different regions. And gang up, gang up on other birds. Oh, yes, yes. I, yeah, um, Australia is supposed to have a very large biodiversity. From the photos and what you're talking about, India does too. Is there any comparison between the two? In, India, to the, to the range, range of diverse, the yeah. range. India is very diverse. In fact, I know one's a continent and another is a country, but to me, it's second only to Africa for the diversity and the, the iconic, dramatic species you see there. I never thought I'd see wolves in my life if I didn't go to Canada or Russia. But I was very fortunate. I was the one that spotted them too. The driver and the guy were standing up on the back of the vehicle one evening in that grass on where the black duck were. And I was there too. I said, I think there's a movement over there. And we had a look, and it was a wolf. And then there was another one. There's a pack of wolves. But they missed it. It was just pure luck. Well, I am used to searching for things, though. But, but they always said, uh, well spotted, sir. You know, that was very good. And they both said, that's very, we were very lucky. But time and time again, I was with uh, not so much a driver, but a guide who would turn to me and said, you were very lucky to see them. About four or five times, but mostly with birds, but also with the, the wolves, because they're few and far between now in India. Mowgli's wolves in Rajiv Kipling's time would be a lot more common than, than they are now. But um, time and time again, whether it's a cream-colored corsair or a hoopoo lark or a demoiselle crane or a hubara busted, They'd say you were lucky. They're not always here. A lot of people want to see them and they've missed out. So you were lucky. So I can't complain. There's things I tried to see, striped hyena at night with the lights off, very quietly on a bet next to their den, but they didn't didn't come out. You know, the babblers must have worn them. We tried again and again, but certain things that were there I, I didn't see, but I can't complain because I saw 80 odd percent of what I could see in, in the time of there. That's a good time of year to go, isn't it? Well, certainly for me, because I don't like the heat.
I don't like extreme heat. You can put up with a certain amount, but when it's throbbing hot and all the smells of the villages come out everywhere, it makes me ill, you know. And uh, no, uh, the weather there was perfect. If you go on an early morning safari at the desk for the hotel, uh, they will give you a blanket. So you sit in the back of the Jeep with a blanket wrapped around you and till about 10 o'clock in the morning you need it too, especially when you're speeding along over rough tracks, you know, to some reserve or freezing cold, even if you've got a, a jacket on. So they knew what they were doing. I mean, I'd rather have that myself than, you know, just to be uncomfortable with the cold for a couple of hours mm -hmm. than relentless heat all day and all night too. And that's the way I am. So for me, it's perfect. I'd, I'd only go in the cold, the cool weather season. Being a national park, were there any elephants around? Not where I was, there are none there in uh, Rajasthan or uh, certainly Gujarat, there are no elephants, but there still are elephants in India. Their numbers have declined, and they get shot at, and they get trapped, and all kinds of things. But um, they are still around. And there are some in the southwest of India, in those um, uh, hills, the western Ghats. There are some in Assam, the northeast of India. And there's some in the Corbett National Park, which was the first one put up, named after that um, tiger slayer, that uh, man-eating tiger killer, Colonel um, Corbett. And uh, he was there in the days of British rule. He wrote a number of books about wildlife, particularly sitting up for man-eating tigers and leopards. And the government was very grateful for him for doing this because they killed hundreds of people, you know. And, uh, they named the National Park after him because although he, he shot tigers and leopards, it's only because they were man-eaters. He loved them, really, and uh, they set it up there because there were such things as elephants and tigers there. That's north of Delhi, not very far. Great place in the cool season, I'm told, but I've never been there, but I wouldn't mind. Mm. Well, um, you might have that up. I'll call on Graham Fry to come uh, and... Thanks. Thank you, David. You really um, you brought back a lot of memories for me. We, we went there in, in, uh, we were there in, in 2013 to the Sam, that area, and, uh, and all the other birds and animals we saw, we thought, hmm, we didn't see tigers. I've never seen a tiger. Yeah. But, uh, so I think for a lot of us, we don't realize that India is such a a diverse country, and we often, as David said, we don't think of India as being so comparable with with uh, Africa for its wildlife, and yet it is. It's a, a stunning place, and the people generally respect their wildlife, and uh, um, and I really appreciate your, your talk tonight, and and sort of um, brings it all, all, all back to us a bit, I think, particularly all, all the COVID and stuff that's been going on, and. It's nice to get a nice story out of India, rather than all the indeed yeah. all, all, the, all the terrible things that are happening there now. So, so, so Dave, thanks very much for your talk. It's really appreciated. But mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. no, one <laughs>
Uh, the latest one, uh, 